I just wanted to mention that BCIT acknowledges that our province of British Columbia is located on the homelands of 203 distinct indigenous nations and cultures with different languages and close to 60 unique dialects are spoken in the province. We ask all participants to reflect, acknowledge, and honor in your own way, the first nation land on which we live, work, and play. And since I am currently in the, on the Burnaby campus, I'll also say that our campuses are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish nations of Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam. Our agenda for this evening or this afternoon is uh, the welcome and introductions, which we're in the middle of. We're going to do a quick poll and then we'll have the presentation and program overviews. We'll speak with program advising and then at the end we'll do Q&A for the time remaining. So our program head slash instructors for the main part of the presentation are uh, Heather Burke and Ken Markin. And I'm not sure who is going to speak, so I will introduce Heather and Ken right now. Welcome. Great. Thanks, Darren. I think I'll go first here. So if you can advance the, the slide there. Yep. Uh, perfect. Thank you. So my name is Ken Markin and I'm one of the co-leads in the sonography program and uh, just to give you a brief overview of our program and our profession. So as you can see on the slide here, diagnostic medical sonography, commonly known as ultrasound, uses high frequency sound waves to examine the developing fetus, the heart, the abdomen, pelvis, and blood vessels. Uh, we can even look at superficial structures. I don't know if many people knew that, but we can look at the breast, uh, musculoskeletal structures like tendon tears, and we can even look at the thyroid gland, for example. And every patient comes with their own unique needs, and as such, you will learn how to perform diagnostic problem solving and team collaboration skills to give patients the highest quality of care. In a nutshell, we operate ultrasound equipment to produce and record images to aid physicians in diagnosing pathology, evaluating treatments, and monitoring pregnancies. Can you move to the next slide? So we are a diagnostic field. And for example, when I was mentioning we monitor pregnancies, we can look for fetal growth, for example. We can also check to see uh, amniotic fluid and see if um, it's too high or too low. And that's one way that we can, um, you know, aid the physician because we can actually measure uh, both the fetus and also the amount of amniotic fluid that happens to be present. We can even use ultrasound to help physicians guide for biopsy. So perhaps uh, in a breast uh, biopsy situation or perhaps biopsying a liver lesion, we can aid the radiologist to safely put a needle into the correct location under ultrasound guidance. And we assess anatomy and the function of organs. For example, uh, we can assess the function of the heart, looking at valve motion and the flow of blood through all the chambers. Um, and the field incorporates anatomy, biology, physics, and direct patient care. care. So you're using all your skills when you go through the sonography program. It allows you to apply all your learned skills and, you know, it may seem daunting to learn about physics, but it's actually applied physics and it's actually very, very interesting. We work in public hospitals and private clinics. Uh, for the most part, uh, ultrasound service isn't 24 seven, but we work uh, during the week and weekends, you know, um, so seven days a week, typically uh, during daytime hours as well as evenings. And sometimes if you're working in a public uh, hospital, you may be actually performing some on-call service overnight. The next slide, please. Thanks, Ken. I'm just going to stop because I did miss the poll. And, uh, oh. and I don't know if he gave anything away, but this will help if people were paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to quickly do the poll before we move forward. Sorry, For everyone. Sure. And so um, can everyone see the poll? Mm, I, I, I cannot. I see if I can move it onto a screen where you can see it. How about now? No. You might have to stop share and then reshare the new screen. Right. Um, it normally does come through on the same screen, but yeah, you have three screens, so I have no idea. 
So it's not happening. Uh, okay. For or you me. could ask us the question and we could do like a number, we could all put one, two, three, or four into the chat. Of what we think sure, I think there's less than 40 people, so we could do that. <laughs> if that's all right, sorry. Um, so or the poll Darren, question. Darren, yes. just let me try. Okay. Yeah, it comes up on the screen that's not being shared. <laughs> Is it coming up for me? I see it. Yeah, okay. I can see it now. Everyone can oh. see it now. Yay. All right, Aaron to the rescue. Thank you. Thank you. All right, excellent. We see some answers coming in. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to end the polling now. And I'm going to click share results. Okay, thanks. <laughs> So Ken, are we right or wrong? Uh, which of the following body parts cannot be assessed with sonography? And the correct choice was actually the lungs. Uh, believe it or not, we can obviously assess the ankle joints. So we can actually look for fluid within the joint and you know tendons and muscles and things like that. Any soft tissue structure can be examined with ultrasound. So we can also examine the heart and the kidneys. So lungs was the correct choice. So for those of you that chose that one, that was the right one. Although we should add with COVID, interestingly <laughs> enough, we can see damage in the lungs, but we can't see normal lungs. <laughs> that's right. That's normal right. lung, you don't see. Yeah. So, so fluid and consolidation, you can see uh, in patients that do have COVID. That's correct. Excellent. That's another fun fact. Excellent. Another fun fact. There you go. <laughs> All right. So off to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your patience, everybody. No worries. <laughs> Uh, so we have a number of options within our program. So first off, we have our diploma program. So we have a dual stream option, which includes both uh, cardiac and general sonography. So that program is 27 months in length. And um, you're uh, part of a cohort with the uh, general stream as well, which is uh, 22 months in length where you just learn about general sonography only. So the first uh, year you're in uh, all common courses because you're a cohort and you're all integrated together. But then in your second year, you begin to stream into your specialties. So if you're in the general option, then you um, take the general courses, which include abdomen and superficial structures, vascular sonography, as well as obstetrics and gynecology. And if you're in the dual stream, you take all those plus cardiac sonography as well. We also have our cardiac advanced diploma which uh, is a 12 month uh, advanced diploma offering. So it's one year in length and you specialize in cardiac sonography, but it does require some um, additional or some prior post-secondary experience. So you need to have a bachelor of science or a health diploma first with some healthcare work experience before you apply for the cardiac advanced diploma. And uh, the next slide, please. So uh, for this next intake, our diploma offering, uh, we are intaking 36 students. So we're planning to take in on 24 dual option students and 12 uh, general only students. We currently are not not offering our single cardiac option within the diploma stream. Uh, the cardiac advanced diploma is uh, replacing that one currently while the uh, cardiac single option stream is just under review. So as I was mentioning on the previous slide, terms uh, one through three are on the BCIT campus where you get to uh, learn and apply that foundational knowledge that we're going to uh, teach you. And you do have a short six week clinical, which is in the summertime between uh, terms two and three, just between your first and second year. And then, uh, depending on your option, you stream in your clinical placements. And so your fourth term would be your um, general or cardiac uh, option sort of clinicals. And then uh, the duals stay on and through to the fall, which is their level five term. And they finish the program in November. Whereas the general option students typically finish the program in at just the beginning of July. All right, next slide. All right, so I'm gonna pass this over to my uh, co-lead, Heather Burke, and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about the Cardiac Advanced Diploma Program. 
Okay, hello everybody. So next year we're doing, um, we're increasing our seat size a little bit. We're gonna have 12 students in our cardiac advanced diploma program. Uh, this program's a shortened program. So you'll, it's only one year, 12 months exactly. So it'll be starting in January, 2022 and you'll be graduating mid-December, 2022. Um, so, which is nice. That means you're, you're in and out quicker and you're making money quicker. Uh, there will be three terms total. Terms one and two A are on campus. So you're on campus from January until the end of May, and then you go to clinical, and then you're in clinical from May till December. Um, clinical, just like our regular program, is anywhere in BC. We cannot guarantee certain locations. We do try to keep you somewhat close to home, but just due to the clinical um, situation, we, we, we kind of go where we've got spots for you. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Darren. So it is an intense program um, because it's only one year long. So you're learning what students in the diploma learn in um, almost double the speed. Uh, because the prereqs are higher, there are slightly less courses. So we're assuming that you're coming in with patient care, communication skills, um, general anatomy. So um, because of that, we have a few less of those extra courses. And then you're really just focusing in on the cardiac sonography portion. So terms one and two, or sorry, term one is on campus. And it's five hours a week of cardiac sonography theory and six hours a week of cardiac lab uh, every single week. Um, so the course is 50% lab, 50% uh, percent theory. And then term two is kind of similar. We've got a month or two months actually on campus full time in the labs with some theory mixed in getting you prepped for your clinical and then in um, starting basically early June you're out to your clinical sites. So it's an intense program but the students we've got six students on campus right now and they are just loving it. They're having a great time. Uh, next slide. Uh, to get into the program, it's uh, there's two different routes you can take to get into it. Option one is a BSc with work experience. So this has confused a few people and I'm, I'm worried people are not applying because they aren't reading that um, quite correctly. We're pretty lenient with the work experience. So if you aren't sure, just apply and we'll assess you. So um, it could be working as a kinesiologist. It could be a co-op job at a gymnasium or like a, you know, a, a working in um, personal training, that sort of thing. Rehab specialists, we've had people apply this year with, um, you know, experience working in COVID clinics and directing patients. So if you aren't sure, I just recommend you apply and we'll let you know if you don't qualify, but don't be scared to apply. Um, anything that's kind of related to working with uh, human beings, right? Working with people, getting them to, um, a lot of that communications type stuff. Um, and the other way to get in is the option to two year diploma in health. So these are people who are working in the hospital already. So maybe you're an x ray tech or a cardiology tech and you're looking for something different. Um, then you can take this one year program and train into this other uh, field. Uh, next. So how do you choose between the advanced diploma or the diploma and that's going to depend on two things. Um, your previous education. So if you don't, so you need a degree to get into the advanced diploma program. So if you don't already have a degree, then your choice is easy and you're going to go for the diploma program. Um, if you have a degree, you still have the choice between the diploma program or the cardiac advanced diploma. Now the difference is the cardiac advanced diploma only teaches you cardiac, which means you will not be certified to work in general ultrasound. If you're interested in working in general ultrasound or as a dual tech, then you will want to take the diploma program, which is longer, but it gives you more options in your career of later on. So there's pros and cons to both. So I would really recommend researching what type of job you want. Um, research where you want to work because certain parts of the hospital prefer having only one type of training versus being a dual tech. So get, get a feel for what's, or, you know, where you want to be, where you want to work, what type of job you want to do, and that'll help you decide which route to take. Next. Uh, I could keep going. So right now our job opportunities is really good. Um, uh, every single one of our graduates is coming out with a full-time job, most of them before they even uh, graduate from the program. So both cardiac and general. Um, I've actually been hearing too that there's a lot of jobs right now in the cardiac stream. So right now we've got 100% job placement rates. Uh, next slide. 
And then what do you do with this career? So most of our students will come out graduating with jobs right away and they're going to work as either an echocardiographer or a general stenographer usually for the first several years of their career once you've got that base and experience and there's a few different routes you can take to kind of further yourself some of them will become department supervisors uh, so you can be kind of supervisor often the supervisor is a working uh, supervisor so they do part-time scanning patients and part-time supervisor role you can get into the teaching side. So you could be like Ken and I teaching at BCIT. You can work as CL, so that's our clinical liaison where you work with BCIT, but in the hospital setting, it's, it's volunteer, but it's a fun experience where you can work with the students when they're in their clinical setting and teach them and write up their reports for them. Uh, some people will move on to sales. You can work for a company like GE, Philips, Siemens, and you can try to help them sell their machines. Um, or you can be a clinical uh, application specialist and they're hired by the big companies to go into the hospitals and teach the techs how to use them. So you're not a salesperson, you're going from hospital to hospital helping people use their machines better. And there's also lots of volunteer work. Um, you can be a Sonography uh, Canada board member. We even have um, techs who sometimes travel to third world countries and do uh, ultrasounds on patients for, as part of an outreach program. So there's lots of opportunities once you're out in the career. I'll take it uh, from here. Uh, thank you, Heather. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Shelley Schumas, and I'm a full-time studies program advisor at BCIT. Um, so I'm joined here tonight by my colleague, Janice Pontus, and she's going to be answering your questions in the chat. So a little bit about what we do in program advising. So really, we help students um, with the admissions process, how to apply to programs, what are the entrance requirements, how to upgrade. Um, they might want to know about the job placements after. Um, students might also want to know um, what kind of supports are out there for them as a student. Um, graduation, what they're going to do. Um, we also help with transfer credit um, and maybe provide you details, even simple things like what's the tuition for a program. So that's a little bit about what we do. And I work with a team of uh, full-time advisors and we also have part-time advisors for part-time studies. And we help students apply to a program like sonography. So that's what our, our team is here to do to help you learn how to apply. Okay, so yeah. So next time we're gonna go over and next slide is the um, entrance requirements. And um, and how to apply to the program. So if you are on uh, bcit.ca website, um, it's really um, a good place to start is going to the program page for diagnostic medical sonography. And on the left-hand side navigation bar, you'll see um, many different tabs that are going to tell you a lot of details. Um, so today I'm going to focus on the program entry tab, but there's also overview as well and um, many other ones. Um, so for sonography, it's a competitive program. So what you see on the entrance requirements page is not going to be exactly what um, maybe many candidates are applying with. They might be applying with well above what's on the minimum requirements. Um, so if you look on the entrance requirements page, you'll see you'll need an English 12 at 73 and a pre-calculus 12, 73 biology or anatomy and physiology 12 at 73 and a physics 11. Um, but in addition to that, um, you know, you may also want to have a, a strong academic history. Um, so perhaps you've done some post-secondary um, to ensure that you have, um, you know, done uh, some studies, um, full-time studies, and that can demonstrate that you're ready and prepared for the academic rigor at BCIT. So uh, maybe you've taken some courses in anatomy, physiology, and post-secondary physics. Um, you may even have um, health sciences background or even a diploma or a degree. Um, so that could also help um, you to uh, stand out as an applicant. Um, another aspect of what they're looking for when you apply is relevant volunteer or work experience. So anything right now that uh, where you showcase your pub your people skills. So it could be working with the public. Um, if you can cater it to something that works with the in healthcare, that would be 
beneficial. So, um, but we understand in COVID it has been challenging. So um, I'll, I'll go over that a little bit later in the presentation about some examples about what you could do um, during COVID. Um, but it could be something as simple as um, getting a senior groceries or helping with, with something like that. Um, but it would um, help to have something in healthcare sciences related. Um, but if you can't, then something where you're working with people. Another thing that um, they're going to be looking for is knowledge of the profession. So how have you researched the profession? Um, this is important for um, competitive programs at BCIT because they want admissions and the department want to know that you know about the profession, you've researched it, you've looked at some websites, you know what the occupation is about, you know what a sonographer does. Um, maybe you've looked at some YouTube videos. We have a lot um, on our website under BCIT on, on YouTube. And there's a lot of students that actually share experiences as well. So I strongly encourage you to do your research before you apply. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to the next slide where we're gonna um, discuss a little bit about the start date um, as well as um, how you can be successful in the program. So for the, so the program start dates, we have the Cardiac Advanced Diploma and that is starting very soon in January, 2022. And they're currently accepting applications. So that's gonna start May, it started May 1st um, and that is going until August 31st. So there is still time to apply. Um, and then for the uh, Diagnostic Medical Sonography, um, the next start date is in September, 2022. And, um, and that's gonna open in October 1st, and that will remain open until January 5th, 2022. Okay, so, and all of this information is outlined on the program pages. So if you go to entrance requirements, you will see this information as well. Um, so I just wanted to point out what some of the qualities that um, they're looking for um, and to be successful in the program, as well as in the profession. So strong communication skills, um, that's important when you're in the classroom with your team members, as well as your colleagues, and once you get working, as well as on your clinicals. So abil ability to communicate well, as well as your uh, written and uh, your written skills as well. And when you do your MAQ, which is your written portion of the application, that's another way to showcase your verbal or your, no your nonverbal and your written communication skills. Um, Another uh, way that you can showcase your skills is um, working well in a, independently, uh, as well as in a team, and that can be in the classroom, as well as when you're on your clinical. So that's another great way to showcase your skills. Another important aspect of this job is physical stamina and being physically uh, able to do the job. Uh, so you'll, um, you do need to have um, quite good physical strength. Um, mental health is also important. So ability to handle stress and time management because it is a busy program and you will need those skills on the job as well, um, effectively managing stress. And um, also ability to handle um, emotional strength. If you are a sonographer, you do sometimes need to have um, handle emotionally stressful situations. If you do uh, have some diagnostic um, uh, aspects of this uh, occupation. So you need to be ready for that. Um, decision making and problem solving skills is also important. And the last point I'm going to make is having good computer literacy, um, 3D visualization, manual dexterity and hand and eye coordination. So you're being able to use the equipment well as a technologist. Uh, so, um, so those are all important skills um, that you might want to think about if that fits for you. All right, so we'll go um, to the next slide and um, we're going to talk about volunteering. Um, so we put this slide in um, because we, we were having quite a few questions about students applying and they've been having some difficulty getting some volunteer work because a lot of the hospitals are not able, obviously, to take in volunteers at this time. So we wanted to just kind of overview this and just let um, all the applicants know that the pre-COVID hospital volunteer experience is an asset. So if you have worked in a any kind of volunteer capacity, um, could or you may have worked um, in an extended care setting with seniors, 
maybe acute care or medical imaging. So definitely put that down. And if you don't, if you're not able to get that kind of volunteering, maybe you could go and look at something online. There are some online opportunities. If you go to govolunteer.ca forward slash COVID-19 volunteering. So there are some uh, opportunities that you could possibly think about. And maybe it's, it's um, perhaps getting, as I said earlier, getting a senior groceries, working at a food bank, it could be working in child development. Um, it could also be community centers. So they are being a little bit more open with that. Okay, so just so that everybody knows in advance. All right. All right, so we'll keep moving along here. Yeah, all right, thank you. So the next slide we're gonna be discussing just how do you apply to BCIT? And, and um, it's a little bit different um, for every program, but um, so the first thing that you wanna do um, is of course for every single program is ensure you have the entrance requirements. That's a that's a fairly um, first step. Um, and just ensure your, your processing dates. Um, so knowing when to apply and when the applications are going to beat the deadlines. Um, if you need to upgrade, you'll need to do that. Um, so collecting your documents. So um, please put everything in a PDF document. The application process is entirely online. Um, at bcit.ca forward slash apply. So everything is online. You don't need to send us a transcript in. You do not need to um, mail it. Um, if you did get a transcript mailed to you, you would open it up and scan it or take a picture of it on um, both sides and, um, and then convert it into a PDF document. Um, the other... Um, Step four of what you need to do um, is complete your mandatory applicant questionnaire. And this is where you're going to showcase your skills again, which is your written skills, as well as all of your background, your, your volunteer work, your academic work, um, all of the um, experience that you have. So just ensure that that's well written. And uh, the next, and you will be uploading that again into your online application. And the next uh, step that you'll have to do is your CASPER assessment. And uh, the CASPER is a computer-based assessment for sampling personality characteristics. Um, and that assessment is an online psychological test. So um, it, it, it's a situational judgment test. So you'll be given scenarios and then you will be graded on how you answer those questions. Um, I would strongly encourage everybody to go on CASPER website and, and, and there's a practice test you can do as well as watching some of the scenarios to see how you would answer them. So, um, and that would be a great idea to do that in advance. And Casper will send your scores and your, your test to BCIT directly. And once you do all that, um, um, you're ready to apply online. Okay, so after you apply, um, you will be, the department will be shortlisting the applications after the application deadline. And the shortlisted applicants will be invited to attend online um, interviews. So it'll be at MMI online, uh, virtual. And the department will make their final decision after that. Um, the process will take um, four to six weeks. So please be patient um, as they go through all the applicants. Thank you. Okay, that will be the next slide, please. Okay, great. Okay, so um, the next here we're talking about laddering. And um, these are opportunities of what you could do perhaps after you finish your diploma um, your, uh, at BCIT. So you can continue to continue your education. Um, so you may want to do magnetic um, uh, resonance imaging advanced certificate or the advanced, uh, Bachelor of Health Science. Um, and that is a part-time online um, and a distance um, bachelor. Um, and then there's um, at, from the um, Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, you can do a Bachelor of Health Science and that's a joint um, a bachelor with BCIT. Um, or if you wanna continue working, um, you could, uh, do a health leadership advanced certificate at BCIT, and that's a part-time certificate that you could do um, while you're working. And finally, we do have a Bachelor of Ma uh, Technology and Technology Management. So you would be learning with other people from other disciplines. So it, not just health sciences, um, 
and the learning about supervisory skills, technical skills and management skills. So that's another area that you could go into if you wanna to continue to learn. There's, um, there's lots of opportunities. Okay. All right, so we'll go to the next one here. Yeah, so um, here I, I just wanted to point out um, that our um, BCIT, uh, our student association, as well as um, our student life office, we follow the eight dimensions model of well-being just to ensure that you're supported as a student. Um, so if you wanted to go to their website, it's bcit.ca forward slash student services, and you would know a little bit more about it. But um, if you are Indigenous, there's supports for you. Um, okay. Um, if you um, if you wanted to um, do student financial aid and awards, if you need a bursary, or if you need um, some financial aid, if you need, a, let's say, for example, um, a student loan information, we have an, a dedicated office for that. And also, one when, when other thing to note is that a lot of our services right now, because of COVID, have, we have actually um, gone online. So there might be ways to access some of these services through virtual appointments or just calling. Um, and if you do have um, needs, um, accommodations, supports, we do have accessibility services. So if you have some supports in, that are necessary for your learning, uh, please contact accessibility. If you have a, a temporary disability or disability, we, you can get assistance there. Uh, we do have student health services as well. So we have a um, health center on our, on our campus and uh, has a doctor and a nurse. Uh, they're offering telehealth services right now. Um, uh, so you may be able to, uh, to touch base with them. Um, we also have, I, list goes on, counseling and student development. So uh, if you do need some help with stress management or um, you need someone to talk to us while you're a student, we wanna support your success. Um, so um, make an appointment with a uh, deceased a counselor or someone in our student life office to talk to them about it. Um, and they're, they're also offering virtual as well. And last but not least is our rec services. And we have a beautiful gym here. And we're hoping we can get back in there perhaps in September. Um, there might be some differences because of COVID, maybe uh, the max capacity will change or there might be some sort of a sign-in service um, for the gym. But, um, they will be um, letting us know how that's going to work, um, and you can always check our COVID-19 page for updates, but um, they will still be offering virtual classes as well, and maybe some in-person classes with physical distancing, and um, they also have an eSports league, so, so things might open up a little bit um, for the rec services, so that's good to know. All right, so that is... Um, that that slide so we can just uh continue the next one here um so basically um i i just encourage everyone that if you have questions um that you cannot answer in a public forum like today if you're not sure about something we we would like to do more one-on-one -on -one support with you um so please call us at program advising our phone number here is um you'll see on the screen is 1-866-434-1610 and we are available five days a week for you so um we do have um our our service hours there on the slide um you could definitely email your inquiry if you prefer email and we also are doing virtual appointments so if you prefer to see somebody um you want that in-person uh, support we also have that as well um, so just check on bcit.ca um, forward slash advising um, for the up-to-date schedule for summer in case that changes. Okay, so we'll go ahead to, um, yeah. So I, I just wanted to encourage everyone to go to the social media handles. Um, there's a lot more information. Um, if you wanted to check, um, we have a lot of the info sessions up on YouTube. Um, you can check the LinkedIn profile, go to Instagram, join the Facebook page. Um, there's a lot to, to, to learn about. Um, another thing uh, we do have is um, the spend a day program, but right now it is on, um, on hold for the moment, but um, it is another way to, uh, to get to, um, 
please go ahead and, and visit with somebody um, that's actually a student in the program. So that's one thing that you could do maybe when it's up and running. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I'll just go to the next slide there. Awesome. Okay. So thank you everyone for all your uh, um, participation today. We've been a great crowd. Um, we've been, and um, at this point, uh, we're going to be going to the question and answer segment of the presentation. So um, we'll be going through the chat and maybe reading some of the questions out loud and trying to answer them as best we can. And uh, we'll also be um, maybe if you had a question, you'd like to unmute yourself and ask Ken or Heather or Janice or I, um, we'd be happy to, um, to help you with that. All right, so thanks everybody for listening. We'll just uh, start our Q&A section. Uh, back home, I'm a physician. I was a physician. Um, I evaluated my certificate from BCIT. It's a long time ago. Um, it says I have done three years post-secondary diploma and studied in uh, British Columbia, grade one to grade 12. Um, it's a medium is English. And I would like to know whether if I select this cardiac program, uh, cardiac advanced diploma program, do I have to do IELTS again and grade 12 English again? Because I they have given me, I'm studying in British Columbia like this, the evaluation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I, 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 the first part of it, you studied in British Columbia, is that? No, the, my, I studied in Sri Lanka back home. My, Medical mm -hmm. background is in medical college in Sri Lanka, but mm -hmm. I everything my all the certificates evaluate in BCIT that I got ICES certification. Mm -hmm. uh, it it says I have done um, grade one to twelve high schools in British Columbia, and after that three years post secondary diploma, like fifteen years uh, studying in British Columbia, in Canada, and it's in English media. So my question is, if I select the program, do I have to do a English 12 again and mm -hmm. IELTS again? Because Shelly, would you like me to answer that? Uh, sure. There, there's a couple of questions that we would ask you if you came in to, to see program advising because you've had your, your uh, credential assessed and yes. they've indicated yes. your equivalency. Um, yes. To meet the specific two years, uh, uh, of English in an English speaking country, sometimes it is specific to the country that you've come from. So we would have to look at that, but we'd also have to look at um, equivalencies and recency as well for you to meet the entrance requirements for the DMS program. So with your questions being quite specific to yourself, I would really recommend that you connect to the program advisor and, yeah. and we can talk um, about your, your particular case um, on a one on one. Yes. Okay. To whom do I have to talk? You could send an if you go to the um I'll actually put in chat. Yeah. How you can connect with advising. Maybe Shelly, if you could do yeah. that really quickly. Mm -hmm. And there are several ways that you can connect with a program advisor. You could request a Zoom appointment and we can speak with you face to face. Mm -hmm. um, you can, we have specific um, call in times that you could uh, speak directly to a program advisor. Um, okay. Or you could send us an email. So those those are our current services that we offer. So oh, yeah. um, we would definitely like to, to speak with you further about, about your questions, okay? Yes. Yes, I would like. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay. I have to send an email to the program advisor. Yes. yes. That would okay. be a start for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, all right. So I see um, Nicole has her hand up. And or we want to go through the questions in the chat because there seems like there's a lot of questions too. Um, Nicole, did you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yeah. 
Okay, perfect. Uh, I was just looking at the program requirements and I was looking at the applicant questionnaire. Um, and I was just wondering like what was expected when we're writing it? Like what would be uh, like traits that you're looking for or something that you would say, oh, that stands out kind of thing? Um, I can answer that if you want. There, do you want to get that one? Yeah, that goes off to our department and then we grade it on a rubric. So, you know, you get scored. That's a tough question. I mean, um, we want to see your unique side. We want to make sure that, you know, you're well written. Um, we don't love it when it's clearly like copied and pasted from the internet. So just make it personal. Um, but it's a hard, it's a hard question to ask because uh, everyone's application is so different. They're all good in different ways. Um, but be yourself and um, make sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. there, okay. are a there are a couple of questions that we could ask that I think if other if, if people didn't have the opportunity to to read or that either Ken or Heather, you might be able to expand on um, mm -hmm. that might be helpful to everybody that's attending. One of them being um, they asked if it certainly it, 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 it is a program where the hand eye coordination is a really important part of the program and some Somebody had asked, well, it, it does, it, do you need to be ambidextrous to be able to manage this kind of program because the coordination of that and what you're doing all day, um, is that something that you would recommend a person, a really big part of the job? Well, you know, obviously, if you're ambidextrous, that's very beneficial, but mm -hmm. it's not necessary. Um, certainly, as you go through the the field or through the program, I should say, um, you will learn how to um, operate the controls as well as scan. Um, you know, you're using uh, your arms differently. For example, if you're doing cardiac sonography, you're scanning with your left hand and you're manipulating controls with your right. And if you're doing general sonography, you're um, manipulating controls with your left hand and scanning with your right. So, uh, you know, certainly ambidextrousness <laughs> is uh, beneficial, but not a requirement. And it is something that, um, you know, when you're in the program, we start you out, it's baby steps, and it's a learned skill. And so um, you will develop that as you go. Good. Thank you, Ken. Um, another question that somebody had asked is if it's a rolling intake, and I think that this is a really important question because no, it is not. It's a competitive application process. You apply to the program. If you have not been accepted to the program, um, you do need to reapply. And often it's really important if you haven't been accepted to the program to connect with a program advisor to kind of go through the requirements to try to determine some areas that you may have been lacking because you don't want to just submit your application exactly like you did when it was not accepted. You want to be able to add things to maybe make your, your application um, a little bit more competitive the next go around. So each, each time you apply to the program, it, it is a, a new application process and you do have to submit everything all over again. Okay. Uh, I see we have a question in the chat from Melissa. Um, she said, in this line of work, will you ever see the same patient more than once? So you can build a rapport be uh, between them or with them maybe? I could, I could start with the cardiac side. I do cardiac and just general ultrasound. Um, the truth is usually you're seeing new patients every day. Sometimes you'll see the same patient more than once. You know, maybe they're in the hospital and need repeat scans. Um, I was part of a research project where it was breast cancer patients came in every month for two years. But on the whole, it's really a new patient every hour for us. And I can, you're probably similar, but I'll let Ken speak about the general side. Yeah, that's correct, Heather, especially if you're working in a large center in a big city, it's probably, you know, different people that you see uh, every, every day. However, if you're in a smaller community hospital, and perhaps uh, in general sonography, you're following an obstetrical patient, and you may be working in a very small department, you may see the same patients again and again. So there are, uh, you know, nuances to it, depending on where you work, uh, whether you're in a a small community hospital or where you're in a larger, uh, you know, metropolitan center. So it depends, but uh, on a general sense, um, you know, you're going to be seeing a variety of patients every day. There's a, another question here that's been asked a couple of times this evening, and it was basically, I've got a bachelor's degree. 
do I qualify for the program? And it's not quite that simple because it's still important for you to refer to the entrance requirements and to look at the specific high school entrance requirements that we're looking for. So you do need to have that foundation of the high school entrance requirements. And um, 73 or even higher, the higher the better in those specific um, high school entrance requirements. And then certainly in post-secondary, um, I think Heather, you had mentioned, I mean, ideally you're looking for somebody that might have a Bachelor of Science or, or at the very least to have some post-secondary with sciences, with human focus and biology, kinesiology, things like that. That's certainly going to in, enhance an application if you've got those upper level sciences and give you a stronger foundation to be successful in the program, right? Yeah, I would agree. I would say like absolute minimum requirement is a Bachelor of Science. So at this point, we're not accepting Bachelor of Arts. Um, within the Bachelor of Science, we prefer kinesiology and biology. Um, however, if you've got, you know, just a basic Bachelor of Science with some courses here and there with health focus, we'll consider that as well. But we're looking at Bachelor of Sciences because it's a heavy science-based program. And that's for the advanced program, right? Yeah, yeah. So if, yeah, so if somebody was coming into the general program, mm -hmm. Even, even somebody coming into the general program, having the high school entrance requirements, and then, and then in addition to the post-secondary in sciences is going to be helpful to have a strong application as well. Because I would say majority of your accepted applicants have post-secondary, don't they, Ken? If yeah, not that's... all of them, I would say <laughs> look, probably, right? That's, that's absolutely correct, Janice. And it's just because we're very competitive uh, uh, program and we have lots of applicants. So certainly, you know, the um, high school prerequisites are essentially the minimum, but many do have um, at least two years post-secondary, uh, if not a full Bachelor of Science as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pardon me for just interrupting right now. I know we've gone over our 45 minutes, so maybe just one more last question or two if they're really short. Is that okay? And if anyone didn't get their questions answered or something more personal, they could certainly um, refer to these email addresses and send in their questions and they will definitely get answered. I could really quickly ask, Caroline asked, um, why can't we see the lungs? <laughs> um, and that's physics. And that's one of the courses you're gonna take is physics. Um, has to do with uh, how sound travels through um, different objects. And if it hits something that's got a very different density, it refracts in every direction. And so it can go through tissues and organs, no problem, but once it hits air, it just kind of goes off in every direction. We lose our signal, so we don't see anything. So lungs and bones, we don't see through. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, I haven't been keeping my eye on the chat very well. Is there anything that's uh, outstanding that anyone wants to get to before I wrap this up? Um, there's a question about someone that has a Bachelor of Food Science um, is qualified for the entry. Um, and then he, oh, okay, I think, I think Heather, you answered that one later, later on. Yeah, I, I don't okay. know much about that program, but if it's a four-year Bachelor of Science, um, it sounds like a science and in, in health related field. So I would say yes. There's also a question about, um, do you have to say which um, stream you want? And you do. So when you're applying, you have to pick your stream. And moving forward, temporarily at least, you can only pick between dual and general. Uh, and then we'll, you'll get ranked based on your application and you may or may not get your first choice, but we'll try our best to keep you into your first choice. But if you ranked high and your first choice is filled, you might go into your second choice. And then you have the option to accept it or not accept it. Um, one last question here as well is somebody had indicated that there's practice tests for the CASPER, but is there anything else that you can prepare for for the CASPER test? And that, that actually is a very common question that we get in program advising. Um, there is, there's some really good resources on the CASPER test site uh, that you can refer to, but Heather and Ken, I don't think there's anything re really beyond that th that you can prepare for for the test, is there? No. So refer to refer to the Casper site. And there's some, some valuable information there that you can refer to then. Um, there's a, some practice videos on YouTube as well for anyone that's really interested. There's quite a bit on YouTube about 
a Casper test. Absolutely. Yeah, so. Okay. So I think that is it for this evening. Yes. Thank you for all of valuable information. Everyone was very informative. I really appreciate appreciate that. Thank you, Ken, Janice, Heather, and Shelley.